Hello everyone, welcome back to Sector One, the first stop you should make for your motorsport fix. Um, I'm Devon, I'm here with Sid, Lirley and Maris, um, and today we're going to be talking about the road to F1, um, talking about driver academies, feeder series, and how different drivers have come through the ranks up into F1. So Sid, do you want to start us off? I think we should begin with talking about Alpine Academy, formerly Renault's Driver Academy, but now with the name change, they've also changed to Alpine. And I think we can all agree Alpine are a strange Driver Academy, really, because as, as we know this year, we have Fernando Alonso as the driver back for his third stint in Formula One instead of one of their Driver Academy members. What are your guys' thoughts on Alpine. It's a really tricky one because I wouldn't say they were in much of a position where they needed like a huge improvement. They didn't need a massively experienced driver to come in and you know try and revive the team. I do think that they were slowly on the way to to improving. So it's I was quite shocked when they announced that Alonso was coming back. Um, I think you know, having Ocon been there a couple of years and also been in Formula One beforehand, it wasn't like he was, you know, a rookie for, for the last couple of seasons. I do think it was a strange choice. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't really know what, what their intentions were there. I think they have a very, very strong driver academy. They have Oscar Piastri, F3 champion, who's now going to Prema in F2. We have Guan Yu Zhou, F3 Asia champion and also very talented like he hasn't had really bad performances and then personal favorite Christian Lungard who is driving for ART in Formula 2. This year they've also taken on Victor Martins and Kyo Collette I want to say that's how you say his name but sorry <laughs> and they're both driving in formula three for mp this year so it's not like they have a weak driver academy it's not like they don't have the drivers there if you get what i'm saying yeah i think, I think go on. oh sorry um i think it's a tricky one because it's the big old problem of there's not enough seats in f1 and especially renault who don't have that like so red bull has their alpha towery Mercedes sort of has like Williams to put their juniors in. Renault don't have that. So it's really difficult to promote drivers when they only have two seats to fill in F1. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I, I think their plan was always to put Antoine Hubert in F1. Like I think that was always their plan, 100%, because his talent was second to none. And I think what happened with him sort of threw their plans up in the air yeah and because they'd have put him in for another season of f2 we all know that and i think he would have beaten mick and become f2 champion oh, and then he'd have got the really i think is. he'd have got the formula one seat but then i think it got to the point where it was like well <clears throat> you know guan yu joe is he ready for it that i think that was the problem and they think just bring alonso back for a season or two and then put one of the young drivers in and the issue also comes up is the fact that guan yu joe and christian Lingard are both like this close to getting the right, enough points for their super license to actually have it and so I think we could have had one of them things where we kind of try and push the FIA to actually give them the super license perhaps a little bit early but yeah there's this whole issue with it the program actually started in 2016 and I wrote down some drivers some notable drivers that they've had in their driver academy before did you know that they had Pasta Maldonado they had Robert Kubica, Heike Kovalainen, Roman Grosjean, obviously Antoine Hubert. They've also had Max Futrell, Sasha, Fe Sasha Fenestras, and Jack Aitken, to name a few. So obviously, Jack Aitken, he's moved on. He's moved on to another driver Thanks academy. Williams, yeah. So it's interesting that he made that move. Was it because Renault, Alpine aren't very good at putting their drivers through to Formula One they don't really do enough well yeah. we've seen that um Fiat's been announced as as the reserve driver um for this year as opposed to you know choosing one of their driver academy um drivers obviously they do have opportunities for those drivers but 
get, not giving them a specific role. I don't know whether Jack Aitken was getting a bit kind of angsty at the fact that he wasn't being given those opportunities because obviously over at Williams, they do seem to be a team that are very open to giving their young drivers lots of opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously Jack then making the move and now being, you know, a reserve driver um, alongside a couple of other young drivers as well. Um, that was, you know, likely to be the main the main reason for it, I guess. He's he was there from 2016 to 19, if I'm correct. Um, and for him to have left must have meant he didn't have that many opportunities because he must have been really ingrained in that program to have been there for four years. So it's obvious that they weren't giving him the opportunities that he wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I think Wang Zhuzhou is another one of the test drivers or reserve drivers for Alpine as well. Now, But I think it would, would have been a good opportunity to put one of their younger drivers, just because I know you can get super license points from FP1. So that's still making progress. And especially if, if you're thinking about putting a young driver in your car, you want to give them experience in the F1 car. So them not bringing them up suggests that maybe they're not looking at that or they're not really immersed in that program because they're not making steps towards it. So despite having drivers in their academy previously that we have seen in Formula One, Grosjean, Maldonado, Kvitsa, none of them have actually graduated from Renault Alpine Driver Academy up to Formula One. Ren Renault Alpine haven't made any drivers. They haven't given them the opportunity. They haven't got them all the way to Formula One. Whereas when we look at other driver academies, they have assisted, they have given them the opportunities, free practices, reserve positions. Whereas Alpine just don't seem to be doing enough, in my opinion, to give the drivers the right kind of push. Are yeah, we agreed on that? The, yeah, to definitely. keep kind of their options open for the future obviously Alonso is not going to be around forever so ideally they want to be putting their time their focus into maybe an upcoming driver thinking yes we'd like to put you in a seat in the next couple of years we're going to try and give you all of the experience and all of the opportunities so that we've got the best candidate to put in the seat and they don't seem to really be that over enthusiastic about giving those opportunities out so it is it's a strange one definitely. Devon I know how you made a comment previously a minute ago about how Alpine have drivers in their academy but they don't seem to have like the seats for them to move up but if we look at McLaren's young driver program they actually don't have anyone in that at the minute and Zach Brown has actually said that's because they have such a strong driver pairing that they don't feel that they could assist a driver at the minute because they see so like they see a bright future with who they've got at the minute and there's just there's there's no drivers they could bring in because they wouldn't be able to give them the right opportunities so whether that's something Alpine need to consider is there much point in having a driver academy if you can't actually help your drivers yeah it's I think McLaren you can tell that, I mean, especially Lando, he seems very embedded in that team. And I personally can't see him really moving anywhere anytime soon. So I guess from that side of it, if you've got at least one seat that you know is going to be filled, you know, somewhat permanently for the foreseeable future, then it is a bit pointless gathering all this, you know, young talent and giving them promises of opportunities when realistically there's not going to be opportunities there um mm -hmm. we've seen with i know nick de Vries was somewhat involved with mclaren um <clears throat> but the the opportunities just never arose for him to to make that um jump into f1 so it kind of works both ways in the sense that there's no point having a driver academy just for the sake of it and saying oh we've got all this young talent if you've got nothing for them to go into Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for not every team it doesn't it doesn't really work and maybe that's something to do with you know the more successful driver academies are the ones that have links to other teams in terms of junior teams or you know teams that have got designated seats um, 
so yeah maybe it just not doesn't quite work out that way for for teams like um, Alpine and McLaren who have got very specific seats that are already filled at the moment so I'm gonna I'm gonna test you guys for a minute so McLaren Young Driver Program can you name three drivers each try and name a driver like who's made it into Formula One through that because there is four there is four the obvious one is Lewis Hamilton there you go yeah that's the obvious one (laughs) I was gonna say Kevin Magnussen yes Devin because I remember his his debut was with McLaren Mm -hmm. so putting two and two together I thought well I must have been part of the part of the academy now Maris you can either go with an obscure (laughs) one or the really obvious one um I'm gonna go with Kevin Magnussen yeah that right yeah yeah so we've obviously also had Lando does anyone have any idea who the last one is they have driven for McLaren they have driven for McLaren I'm trying to think back to oh Stoffel van Dorn yes Stoffel but Stoffel also has quite tight ties to Mercedes junior team which is interesting um the issue people have with Mercedes junior team is that because they have Mr seven time world champion soon to be eight they don't have much opportunity to give the drivers a chance but then we look at um George who is driving for Williams and is very very close to Mercedes do we think Mercedes are giving them opportunities as well or are they completely missing the shot there I think they're just ignoring them like look at you know when Lewis got COVID it would have been I know they brought George up but George did have a seat exactly it'd have been you know you've got a reserve driver like Paul Stoffel was just there he was, he was hung out to drive thinking yes I've got the seat and then he lands and it's like no nope, sorry you know I just think why have a driver ready to do that where you're just going to go to Williams and get as much as I, w- I wanted George to have that opportunity like, I did want that I just think it doesn't really make much sense I know it's to strange. have your reserve driver and then get a Williams F1 driver and you know it would be all right if like Stoffel was completely on the other side of the world and had plans and was busy it would make sense to maybe think oh George but they also have Esteban Gutierrez who I'm pretty sure was following them around that year like yeah. with them Stoffel flew out on like the Monday it's just and then he was like no and I just thought that was a little bit harsh making him fly out or being like you know we've got an opportunity for you to then turn around and be like oh well we've we've just filled your seat that should actually be your seat with someone else I just thought I was don't see the point in having you it makes it it makes it all very complicated what they did because like they they took another Formula One driver from another team yeah they have tight connections George is there to be nurtured into that Mercedes seat eventually but then they just cause more problems for Williams having to then bring up Jack Aiken like I'm so glad they both got that opportunity that yeah so well deserved but it's just it was a slightly unorthodox strange. way of doing it you know yeah. yeah I think if it was if George was with any other team I don't really think it would have happened um mm. but you know as we've seen Williams develop into somewhat of a of a junior team for Mercedes I know that Claire Williams wasn't too fond of the idea but I think yeah if it was any other team it it, it wouldn't have happened mm. it's quite I a think... hard one because even at the contracts like they had to they'll have to have got Jack a contract change George's contracts mm. it got him a contract with Mercedes like Stoffel would have had a contract to be able to drive that car at any race I think that was the most complicated thing, having to get like three contracts in like two days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially a team like, I think the bigger teams like Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari, they probably all have the facilities to be able to support young drivers. And they're probably missing that opportunity to do that. Because I think, especially Mercedes, who are literally dominating, team like McLaren, Alpine, they probably need to put a lot of their focus into like being good in F1 there's no point getting breeding all these junior drivers if there's not a good team to step up into but Mercedes have that and they should probably be using that to think about the next generation because they've got George but Lewis is with this be a whole topic but Lewis will probably be like we don't even know if he'll retire end of this season maybe do one more so they need to start sort of I know they back 
a few drivers, but they haven't got like a full on academy. Definitely. Oh, they've got Frederick Vesti, haven't they? Yeah. I feel like he was yeah. just announced. He was very recent. He, he's he's got a chance I think he has a chance of getting into Formula One because he's a very good very good driver but that's the only name that I really know from the stage you know oh they've got one of the Aaron brothers Paul Aaron yeah yeah I couldn't remember which was the younger one which was the older one I know they've got one of them but I think Vest is their best chance of hope in a way the thing with Mercedes yeah. is that, yes, they take drivers such as Frederick Vesti, who's in Formula 3, but they, they're they very good on assisting drivers from, like, the early stages of their karting days. So giving them, like, endorsements, helping them with the money kind of side of things, nurturing them all the way up to single-seaters. So, like, there's Andrea, Kimi, and Tonelli, who's in karting right now, we, we've probably never heard of that name I don't know if you recognize that name at all but that's because he's still in karting like how many people can you name that are in karting like it's, it's just it's not, not really we really know is it we don't really follow that as tightly as we follow single seaters so I respect them for helping the younger drivers in karting get their way up because we know how ridiculously expensive that is and I definitely think we can touch on that subject when and if we get a driver on the podcast the costs of stuff will be very interesting to look at but something something I was looking at is their past drivers and ones which in my opinion aren't affiliated with Mercedes anymore and that is Esteban Ocon and one of my favorite drivers who got kicked out of Formula One Pascal Verlein. Sad times. Sad times. <clears throat> I'm disappointed. I'm going to yeah, say Ocon's a strange one as well because we were talking about this the other day that you get the impression that it's just more of a kind of managerial role of for like Toto to be, you know, pulling the strings to get Ocon just in a seat. Um, you know, we saw in Drive to Survive his kind of conversations with, um, I've completely blanked. Who's the Cyril? Cyril, That's it. My God. Um, But yeah, we saw like those conversations and you get the impression that he wasn't pushing too hard for Ocon to be put into a Mercedes seat. And obviously there wasn't the opportunity at the time, but yeah, he was then just making sure he got a seat in Formula One and whether that was, you know, we would like to keep you in Formula One for a future in Mercedes. I doubt that. Um, So yeah, he just seems to be drifting further and further from from any sort of relationship with Mercedes. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. I'm going to save my favourite Driver Academy for last. <laughs> so I think next we should move on to Red Bull's junior team. Interesting ah. one. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> At the minute, actually, no, let me first try and explain to you Red Bull junior team. So Rebel Junior Team have drivers that they that are in the junior team, but they also have Red Bull supported drivers. So Red Bull supported drivers, they have Jack Doohan and Dennis Hauger. They're probably the most notable ones. But then actual Red Bull Junior Team drivers, they have Liam Lawson, Yuri Vips, Johnny Edgar, Jay and Deruvula, Jack Crawford, and a name that I cannot say, a Yumu Wasa. <laughs> it's a good attempt. <laughs> yes. uh, so it's very interesting. Why are they supporting these drivers, but not having them in their team? Like, I don't really know how that makes any sense. I think... <laughs> more than anything I think it's for the advertising because obviously as a Red Bull supporter all you really do is like run Red Bull on your car you wear you know your overalls your helmet you know and you have to have it on your Instagram Mm -hmm. I think because obviously the two names they've got like Jack Doohan quite a like the Doohan name in motorsport anyway yeah and obviously he was very hyped around like Dennis Howe was hyped around for this season in Formula 3 and yeah I think it is slightly for advertising with them because they don't really do much with them no not at all they just sort of slap red bull on them and off they go yeah there's a lot of red bull have sort of the biggest junior program 
which is why you sort of question they support so many drivers and you think are they do Red Bull know that all of those are probably not going to make it because they've got like four seats at most in F1 so are they sort of the driver academy's purpose is it to get them to F1 or is it to sort of like nurture them and teach them the skills things like PR and things like that um so that they're ready for the motorsport world even if they don't go to F1 Mm-hmm. I think I think... they drop people very easily though like, they drop mm-hmm. people like Dan yeah. Tickton he was dropped Calamano. like that you know li- like lot, yeah. just mm-hmm. even just Alex Albon like... got dropped <laughs> yeah. yeah they just drop drivers it's like when Pierre Gasly just got moved back into Toros it's like you're not good enough six races go it's a brutal environment like to have, they like to have options and it's frustrating because they're always wanting a consistent driver you know they've kept saying that in order to have any sort of battle with Mercedes and constructors they need somebody who can perform weekend in weekend week out to like match with Max but if you're not giving one driver the opportunity and the belief to develop fully in that team they're never going to be able to perform consistently if you're going to give them six races and then boot them out the seat like how on earth is anybody supposed to to be able to get that performance out that quickly and that consistently when you're not fully supporting them and I think them you know supporting all these different drivers and having a huge kind of talent pool I don't know whether they're you know trying to set themselves up for having people that they can swap in swap out to try and you know, find a new max, really, I guess is what <laughs> ideally they're after. But personally, I think they need to stop comparing all of their drivers to max and just give somebody a chance and stick with them because, you know, keep swapping and changing. A is a nightmare for <clears throat> the kind of admin side of it, I can only assume. Um, but you're, you know, yeah, they're never going to fully develop a driver if they're not giving them that length of time to to feel into the team. I completely agree with you, Devon, on that one. I think I, I was reading an article when I was preparing for today and it was people saying, why are we comparing drivers to the likes of Max Verstappen and Charles Leclerc trying to find a teammate who is going to perform at the same calibre? The whole point is, we look at Max, we look at Charles, their performances throughout their entire career have been like, amazing yes we have ridiculously talented drivers all f1 drivers are on a whole new level but max and charles a world champion standard like already at their really super young ages they are ready to challenge lewis hamilton in my opinion if they have the right car the right machinery they would be up there fighting with lewis every weekend but we can't we're not just going to produce world championship drivers like that every single day not all drivers are gonna reach that standard I think about it quite a lot you know how you look back at old races and there are just drivers on the grid that you you don't really recognize their names because you never hear anything about them they've never done anything notable you got to think about it despite us knowing everyone on the grid now and loving the majority of them in 10 years time when the grid is completely different what names now are people just not going to remember? Because quite a few, exactly. There's mm. going to be, be so quite many. a few on this grid that people just think. Oh. And so, yeah. of course, they're not going to be like Max and Charles, who we'll probably be talking about for years to come. Yeah, they'll be like the Ayrton Senna, Ayrton. Yeah, <laughs> the Max Verstappen. <laughs> I'm not really confused. <laughs> they'll be like, you know, the Pete, like Nigel Mansell, like the, the names you know. No matter like we didn't watch them race, we went alive. Yeah, but. We know about, like, Nigel Mansell, everything. We know all of that. Yeah. That's what Max will be. I think it's unfair for them to compare to Max because even if you look at Max and Charles, their driving styles are so different. Same with, like, Max, Charles and Lewis, all three of them, completely different drivers, but all equally. Can we just note this is coming from a Max Verstappen fan? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They're all, I'd say they're all on the same level, like they are. Obviously, I'm going to say Max is just, <laughs> just, just pipping them. But mm. they're all equally as good drivers and they've all got completely different driving styles. Yeah. So I feel like comparing, like, Paul Yori Vips to Max Verstappen is never going to work because their driving styles are polar opposites. 
I just don't see how Red Bull can say like Sergio Perez doesn't drive anything like Max. No. So I don't know how they think that they're going to have, you know. Good drivers performing yeah. the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not everybody is going to be a world champion. Like, that's just the way it works. Yeah. Like, otherwise, there'd be no point having a championship if there's no kind of, you know, clear winner or, you know, if it's a very... Obviously, we want an equal competition and for it to be, you know, loads of different people on the podium. But if there's not, like, one driver that's you know, outperforming and being the clear champion, then you could have said, well, any one of these could have been a champion. It's just not the way it works. Um, but yeah, they just, I just can never get over the number of people that have come and gone just from Red Bull or Toro Rosso. It's just, it, it, there is people, even from like the last three, four years that you completely forget about and think, oh yeah, they were in Toro Rosso for a year. Like what have they gone on to do? Like what did they do within the sport? And they've just been booted out again so it's yeah it's it really frustrates me actually that was going to my next point Mm. about the amount of drivers they have so we talk about red bull they've got a second driver issue blah 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 blah. but they have had one of the most successful programs in number of drivers who've made it they've had 16 red bull junior team drivers make up to formula one and they've had seven supported red bull drivers make it to formula one that's insane that is it a is. lot of drivers if you think though they drop drivers for breathing wrong so it's like it's a yeah. lot to have and then I think well five of them are probably dropped because you know Helmut Marko didn't like the way he got into the car so Tony Hartley <laughs> John Eric Vern Carlos Sainz yeah. <laughs> like I think that was dropped for no reason just mm-hmm. see ya yeah the, the I think the Red Bull driver program people look at it and think they're so harsh on their drivers but even the ones, so think about Jean-Éric Verne and Sebastian Buemi, are two, because I form, follow Formula E, they're two that I always remember from F1. And I vividly remember Red Bull promoting Ricardo over Jean-Éric Verne and thinking that's such a weird decision. He's like the younger driver, Verne's got so much more experience. But I think he, Jean-Éric Verne's like the most successful driver in Formula E because he's got two championships now. And I think that's probably saying the driver academy at Red Bull worked really well because it allowed him to build that foundation and become a really good driver so he could carry that set of skills over to another championship. Mm-hmm. I just, I think with the, I don't know if anyone saw Max did a three-part interview on the Dutch, I can't pronounce it. Yeah. And part of that three-part interview was saying when he signed his contract with Toro Ross, obviously he was like our age, like 17, he knew that he, that Danny Kvyat was going to get the boot halfway through the 2016 season for him. He came out and someone translated it all to English because obviously we don't understand Dutch. So I read it all through in English and it was basically saying that he knew that at the Spanish Grand Prix he was going to have that seat because they were going to kick out Kvyat and put him in. So it wasn't... He, he basically said when he signed his contract, Helmut Marco told him, you know, do a year in Toro Rosso and then halfway through your next season you know welcome to Red Bull I yeah. just think that's really toxic on Kvyat to it's think crazy. Yeah, that they were telling a, a 16 year old 17 year old like you know you'll have that seat in a year and a bit I just think it's, it's crazy. harsh it's one thing to you know get drivers up into Formula One but it's another thing for them to go on and be successful because you know we say the number of drivers that Red Bull have got up into Formula One but compare that to the number of drivers that have had significant you know victories or championships it's a lot smaller number um Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of the time they bring up drivers or swap drivers between their teams just because they maybe can as opposed to you know just because you can doesn't mean you should like I I get that you know a lot of their a lot of what they want to be doing is giving young talents the opportunities you know that's always been a big part of their brand is to you know get people up into the sport and yes they've done that but have they been all that successful going on from that I'm you know not not as sure been, if you think the only person they've got into F1 they've got Seb into F1 you know a four-time world champion with Red Bull then you know the big memorable ones is only like really him Danny Rick and the Max. The rest of them have just sort of obviously Gasly's done well, but he slid under the radar and was sent straight back to what was Toro Rosso. Album was just sent off to 
DTM, you know, just sacked off. Mm-hmm. We, we don't want you in F1. I think that was really harsh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I there's think a lot of names. Yeah, there's a lot of names, even from like when Red Bull started, they had um, like uh, Alga Suari, Scott Speed, like loads of just rap- like names from Toros and Red Bull that I think unless you really love F1 and you remember everything, you just won't know. And there's so many of pe- like people like that. And then like Sebastian Vettel comes in and he gets promoted and he gets the championships. So I think a lot of it is dependent on the driver and the fact that there will be the special one like Max who comes along yeah. once a decade for a team and is world championship material. Mm-hmm. I think Definitely. they'll struggle to find another version of Max if that's all they're looking for. Because yeah. like you said, that all, that's all they seem to be looking for in the talent pool. Yeah. And it's quite dangerous to do that. It's going to be yeah. hard to find that because he was someone they found at, what, 14? And basically gave him an F1, tra- mm-hmm. F1 contract immediately. And I don't I think, think that happens at, that often. Yeah, looking at Max's junior career, he went up so quickly. And obviously for that to happen people must have thought right this guy's the real deal this is obviously somebody that's going to go on to do amazing things um but I think even back to their time with Vettel they they tend to focus a lot on people like Vettel people like Max that they know if they're given the opportunity they can perform and that they can go on to do great things and they seem to neglect the second seat in terms of really thinking about things logically as as opposed to just okay we need someone in the seat we need someone that can get on the podium we need someone that can do this that and the other and I think they're very unrealistic in in that terms as you said if they're looking for another max you're gonna you know it's gonna be a bit difficult it's to do that be a struggle because like yeah. I said his junior career is basically non-existent it's like exactly. you know karting a season in Formula 3 then it was basically f1 yeah that's you know it was hard it was hardly anything I just think you're not going to find obviously the rules on super license points have changed since then and I feel like they were changed because of him because yeah. he got in it mm. he got in it younger than me into F1 that's just mad to think and I think that was sort of dubbed as too young he's obviously proven that he wasn't too young you know very successful driver in his own he way said now he's an exception to it yeah. It's not everybody that can come in at and just I think he signed his contract at sixteen, but he didn't actually his debut was seventeen when he when he first drove for yeah. them. But yeah, he's definitely proven himself, but that's not to say that everybody another, else can yeah, do that. Another seventeen year old could come in and, you know, ruin the grid. So yeah. I think I get why they changed the rules, but Red Bull are gonna struggle to find Max two point oh. You know, never gonna find that. The rules with super license points since Max have actually changed quite a bit. So even to have a free practice super license, you have to be 18. You have to have a grade A competition license. You have to have had six races in Formula 2 or 25 points previously from other series. So as you can see, it's hard to get the free practice super license, let alone the full proper super license. Yeah. Because it's you have to have... One. You have to have an actual road car license. I know, Lan- I'm pretty sure Lando didn't know how to drive when he got his Formula yeah. 1. He didn't have his license. Max didn't have his. That's, it's crazy to think that, like, oh yeah, you can go and drive this very, very fast car. But no, you cannot drive on the roads. That's just... Yeah, it's weird to think. It's strange. It's very, very weird. I just picture them like asking their parents for lifts to like... The Red Bull factory, <laughs> but I just need to go like to the simulator. Can you drop me off or something? It's just, it's crazy. It's, it, it blows my mind. It's, it's like quite funny. Not being able to drive from like the hotel to your Formula One race yeah. <laughs> where you're going racing at 200 miles an hour. It's like, oh, just gonna get a taxi. Oh, it just doesn't God. seem right. So I think next driver academy we should touch on is one which isn't, isn't that popular nor spoken about is the Sauber junior team. Yes, it is still Sauber. It's not Alfa Romeo, but it does kind of feed Alfa. It's a bit odd. Yeah. Yeah. It's very odd. I feel like they have got tailpool chair. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I don't know if they've still got him, but I know last season they definitely had him. And they had, is it Tatiana Calderon at one point? Oh, yeah, they used to. Yeah. 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 But she just, there was, yeah, a whole other situation. Yeah. But I just think it isn't 
you've got one noticeable driver. Exactly. Mm. I think they rely on Ferrari quite heavily. Yeah, definitely. Another interesting name, just just the surname is what we know. We don't actually know the person, but it's Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. is also a part of the Sauber Jr. team. The Fittipaldis confuse me so much because I can't work out like... They're everywhere. Enzo and Pietro. They're they're brothers. Yeah, Yeah. and then they're like grand... They're the grand... That's the grandchildren yeah. of like Emerson. And Emerson Jr. is like seven. And he's the son of Emerson, as in like the F1 champion Emerson. He's oh. the son. And, and then Pietro and Enzo are the grandchildren on the mum's side. It's, oh, it's, I'm so confused. So weird. <laughs> so like the seven-year-old is the son and like the 19-year-old is the granddaughter. Grand, oh, <laughs> grandson. <laughs> <laughs> he's the grandson. So confusing, yeah. so confusing. Mad. A whole different, yeah. They do have 10 drivers currently, but I was going through the names and I was like, yeah, don't know who, don't know you, don't know you, but Teo Porsche <laughs> and Emerson Fittipaldi Jr. are the notable names that they have. They, they nurture have ta- talent. Yeah, they have 10. Crazy. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> I think they're in carts. I think that's why we don't know about them because I think Sauber okay. are big on carts to feed a series to then Alfa Romeo they actually were partnered with Charousse for a few years they that broke up in 2019 but they had a very close partnership with Charousse which is obviously very good at the time because it means you have Formula 2 Formula 3 I don't know what other series they're in but you have that them seats to put them in to build their single seater careers which in my opinion, are very, very important. Okay, so next we're going to talk about Williams Driver Academy. This is a driver academy with, I think, some really promising drivers in there. They have Jamie Chadwick, who's obviously W Series champion. They've got Dan Tipton in Formula 2, who's very set on getting that title this year, I'm pretty sure, with how he was talking last year. Yeah. We have Roy Nisani. I don't really know too much about Rory Nassani apart from that he brings money with him. Yeah, that's what I know. And he had a crash with Dan Tickton last year. That's nothing yeah. I know about For the him. lead or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and because he got reverse squid pole and then didn't know how to defend and just turned. Yeah. And then Dan obviously doesn't... Dan just drives. Yep. <laughs> just, just drives. And then finally we have Jack Aitken. Hell Ooh, yeah. yes. <laughs> We love Jack over here. We do. We love Jack. We have like a Jack fan club and a Mick fan club put together. That's just us. Yeah. <laughs> We're Mick and Jack, Jack and Mick. Fans. <laughs> Jack and Mick. That just... any time you want to talk about them, come to us. We will. We will happily we... talk to you. <laughs> talk for hours about it. Yes, definitely. We could do a whole episode on just Mick Schumacher alone. <laughs> I'd be so cool with that. Honestly, I think we need to do that when the season starts. Definitely. <laughs> So, back to Williams Driver Academy. (laughs) I think they are a really good driver academy, personally. I think they do help their drivers a lot. I don't know how you guys feel about them, but, like, we've had Rory Nassani and Jack Aitken in through practice sessions this year, and they've been doing amazing. They've been getting super licensed points from that. Like, what other team have we had having junior teams we've had a few ferrari driver academies who who will get on to but i think they've been doing really well what are your guys what are your guys's thoughts i really like them i think they've got a good range of talent as well mm-hmm. do you know when we're talking about max and we're saying they just want max they've got williams seem to have loads of different driving styles yeah because if you look at jack aiken and dan tickton they race in two completely different ways mm-hmm. but they're both equally as good yeah we've never really seen much of roy and like we've not seen We've seen him crash a few times and be P20, but he's got potential. And it's lovely to see a girl in this driver academy, Jamie yeah. Chadwick. She uh, she's good. she's a Brit, and so we obviously are backing her 100 percent as a yeah. fellow girl and fellow Brit. And I think she really has the F1 potential. I would love to mm. see her in that Williams seat one day. I yeah, think I she think, does. If... I think it between her and Jack. Mm-hmm. If anyone was to get if any team was to give a female like an opportunity I feel like it would be Williams and it might just be because in my head I'm like Claire Williams Claire, I love her yeah, yeah. And I know she's not there anymore but Williams just gives me like this family vibe where they support everyone 
and it yeah. seems so lovely I think evidence of that is like George right now yeah. and how much he's grown in that team and, and how it's not just is. like yeah yeah it's not just he goes there he drives done he literally like knows everything and he communicates really well with them literally since he got there Williams has become so much better yeah yeah That's I think so. it's a real shame that they're not as competitive because I think first of all they've got a good size driver academy as well like yes they've got a range of different characters different driving styles but it's not like Red Bull that have got a ridiculous amount of drivers no, they that can't control that many yeah mm -hmm. exactly they've got enough to have different people that they can you know pick and choose between but still they're able to give them the opportunities because there isn't like a huge a huge number of them so it does I do think it's a it's quite a successful one Jamie Chadwick yeah, is not the first girl that Williams Driver Academy have given the chance to. The lovely Susie Wolfe was also test reserve driver for Williams, which I think is absolutely incredible. Um, but they've also had some uh, three names that we, we see today in motorsport. Nicholas Latifi, he graduated into Williams, which is brilliant, brilliant. I yeah. love to see that because it really shows they give their drivers a chance. And they also had Valtteri Bottas and Nico Hulkenberg. <laughs> you can't say that name any other way. I refuse. No. I refuse. I think they've got a good driver lineup at the moment with, you know, Latifi. I think he's a good driver. I think that's an unpopular opinion from the comments I got on my TikTok. <laughs> but I think he's a good driver. And I think when George moves well, it's never to always going to go to Mercedes in the next few years, that bringing someone like Jack Aitken to work with Nicholas Satifi would be a really good one. But then Jack's like 25, 26. I know, he's older than I thought, yeah. Yeah, I just think... think George Russell's like, what, 23? Yeah. Yeah, are they, are they going to give him the guess, chance or, yeah. or Dan, who's Dan's like 19, 20, uh, uh, 21? Young. Yes. There is definitely mm. some big issues with this whole like age thing because if we look back in the good old days, you know, and we had yeah. Senna, Lauda, Prost, they were all like, I I don't know how old they actually were, but like loads of the drivers Older. were late twenties, mid thirties, like. But now we see like, oh yeah, a driver needs to be in F two by by like eighteen, and they need to yeah. be there by twenty and in Formula One at twenty one. Like we have this basically unwritten rules of the ages you have to be in formula yeah. one and so i think yeah jake hughes is a prime example of that though he's like what 26 and he was in formula three mm -hmm. i think he was a perfect thing to show obviously he wasn't he was good he was good but he wasn't the best on the grid and i feel like he hasn't signed this season i'm not too sure he's a reserve driver for formula three i'm sure mm -hmm. so i've think he is but I feel like he shows that the age norms don't always work because he started his career at like our age yeah he didn't start casting until he was like 17 so if you think his careers are normal like 10 years to get into F3 is quite normal yeah but if you look at him at 26 you think you know should, should be moving on by now <laughs> yeah. yeah you think you would load a stuff like if you look at tail pull chair he was 16 and winning races oh my god that made me feel mm. so ashamed to be like an 18 year old I'm like you yeah. are how yeah. old and you're winning Grand Prix. What am I doing? Sitting on my ass doing yeah. nothing with <laughs> my life. Like, he's like three months older than me. And I was like, no, younger than me. And I was thinking, you're younger than me and you're winning Formula 3 races. Yeah, Where did crazy. I go wrong? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you know, please just give me some of that motivation. <laughs> I know, I know, it's crazy. Right. I think a anyone... lot of it also comes down to the, just the opportunities that are there on the grid. Like, if there isn't if it's quite a stagnant driver market then there's not going to be those seats that are coming up so for you know people like Jack Aitken or Nick DeVries or you know people that could have maybe gone up and taken a seat there just wasn't the opportunity there for them to move up even even if you know the teams were fully you know backing them to yeah. to make the move so it I think it sometimes comes down to just luck and timing yeah. as well. It's like right place, right time. Yeah. You know, George was right place, right time. There was a seat there for him. You Whereas guys... Jack's like... Mm. Can you guys see, like, another driver on the grid going to 
Williams if George was to move up to Mercedes? Because personally, I don't know who would want to go down to that team at the minute, like as harsh as it is. Like, I feel like they're better at nurturing young talent because young drivers are just happy to have the Formula One seat. They're, they're not too fussed that it's not the fastest car on the on the grid. Yeah, that's Ocon. probably like the best place for rookies to go. Yeah. Yeah, I do think because Ocon, it's though, like it's Toto. Mm. Yeah, it's maybe like a learning opportunity. Mm-hmm. Definitely. But mm-hmm. I do think that maybe Ocon just because... Toto is his manager, and if Alpine, you know, like we speaking before, if they want to bring like Guan Yu Zhou up, mm-hmm. Ocon will be out without a seat. And if there's a free seat, you know, Toto's going to put him, he'll put him anywhere as a seat, you know, he'll mm. just shove him anywhere. <laughs> we've seen, yeah. So, I do think Ocon's the only possible driver that would go back a step. The only thing mm. I was going to say is it could go the opposite way and have like maybe more of an experienced driver that's coming towards the end of their career but still yeah. wanting to to stay in the sport so mm. bit of Alpine. a Kimmy yeah I was gonna say Bottas maybe obviously yeah. he was successful in William so it'd be a nice cyclical well, move back down mm. um oh, so, be nice. but that obviously comes down to whether the team would value a more experienced driver over a rookie um but you know as we've seen Jensen Button coming and taking more of a role within the team this year maybe having him they've already got that sort of ex-driver experience um, insight they don't yeah as you said they don't particularly need it so I think realistically it would most likely be a rookie and you know the younger drivers that are on the grid already as we've said I don't think they'd it wouldn't really make sense for them to move down to Williams yeah. if they're it still wanting a, to further a career yeah, it, yeah like you said it wouldn't be a career move in no, the slightest yeah. you'd be going backwards yeah are we ready for my favourite driver academy <laughs> yeah I think we are um, yeah <laughs> Ferrari driver academy we have Marcus Armstrong Robert Schwarzman <laughs> Arthur Leclerc <laughs> Callum Eilat Mick Schumacher <laughs> Dino Boganovic Maya Woog and James Wharton Yes, they have such a good driver academy. Though, let's just like mm. take a second for the talent yeah. they have in there. They have links, obviously. I know they have links with Prema mm-hmm. in F two mainly. I just think their driver academy is just something else. It's yeah. brilliant. It's such a good structure. Like to have Prema through F three, F two. It's such yeah. a good like sort of ladder up. It's all planned mm-hmm. out. Exactly, exactly. I adore it. And they've got their first ever w- female Maya Woog, who was part of. A program FIA program of getting girls on track, and, yeah, and they yeah. did all the things the where they went. Stars to, or yeah, yeah it was star. like for the girls, and then it got stopped because one of them got COVID or something, and then <laughs> one of them got dropped. Uh, it was a confusing one to follow. So Enzo Ferrari said that he believes Ferrari can create drivers as much as cars and this is where the whole Ferrari Driver Academy stemmed from I made a video about this on my YouTube channel before and so I feel like so knowledgeable in this (laughs) even though really quite not very not so they've had this they had the success of having Felipe Massa growing from Salba and then moving him up to Ferrari and so after this they decided to create the Ferrari Driver Academy in 2009. Jules Bianchi everything he was the Mm. first ever member and he obviously made it up to Marusha and yeah they are carrying out Ferrari Driver Academy and all this work in memory of Jules that's why it's still up and running today all because of our lovely Jules Bianchi um they've had sweet I know that's adorable that's adorable it just makes me love it more yeah so Ferrari Driver Academy don't just want to be teaching their drivers how to be good Formula One drivers. They're actually teaching them all about the regulations, the legal stuff. They're teaching about the history of Ferrari. And this is all to try and make the best Ferrari drivers they can possibly have. And as we've seen, Charles Leclerc is probably the most notable driver who is now at Ferrari. So I think we can say it's, it's a pretty successful team. They've also had Sergio Perez, Lance Stroll. Who else have they had? Jules Bianchi. 
They also had Antonio Fuoco, who is actually still working behind the scenes. Antonio Giovinazzi, still working behind the scenes. So, yeah, I love it. I think they've got a brilliant lineup. I think they do all they possibly can to help their drivers work their way up that ladder. Nothing but respect. Yeah, I think they have a good, they don't, like you said, they do, I know they just do fitness camps. Yeah. But if you look at the Ferrari ones and the stuff that gets posted from them, from the likes of like Marcus Armstrong, per se, he posts a lot about it. Yeah. And I just think it just looks like a fun environment to be in. Mm-hmm. Like they Definitely. look happy as much as it does seem like obviously this one driver I can't remember his name for life of me but he does have a famous dad so I feel quite ashamed I shouldn't know his name Alessi there we go Giuliano Alessi mm-hmm. thank I could not remember his first name there we go he the way he treated the way they treated him when he left was nice still like obviously he got dropped but they were like you know you're getting dropped but you can still drive the Ferrari F1 car and for me that just seems mad Yesterday, they actually, Ferrari Driver Academy made a post and it was Giuliano Alessi, Enzo Fittipaldi and Gianluca Petakoff, who have all now left Ferrari Driver Academy. Yeah. And it was like, a, good, good luck on your next future, next and future endeavours. And I thought, what other Driver Academy does that? Red Bull just lovely. Like, Red Bull just tie bricks to them and drown them. Exactly. Like Red Bull just like, you know, bye. bye. <laughs> you just exactly. slam the door in the face. You get a real kind of family vibe from them. And I think, you know, Obviously, Callum Eilat and Marcus Armstrong is like a big, a big kind of friendship and probably the most I know, adorable. I love the them. most popular one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just it's such a firstly a well established kind yeah. of obviously the Ferrari name. You you want to drive for Ferrari. Every Formula One driver says it, regardless of any current performance at the moment. But you know, it's such an iconic name that there's going to be want... the best of the best are going to want to be part of that driver academy so I think first and foremost that's a big selling point for them Um, and then obviously their links with other teams so I did a little bit of research and from what I understand they basically have control over one of the Alfa Romeo seats and then the links with Haas although it's maybe have a stronger connection than with Alfa they're still a very independent team um, so they can kind of use that team to bring their drivers up into but they don't they can't really dictate the seat as much as they do with Alfa Romeo was what I gathered from from my research Um, so I guess having that there's multiple opportunities for them to bring up their talent as opposed to you know we talked about Alpine or McLaren with just having the two seats if those two seats are filled then there's nowhere really for their talent to go so I think that's probably one of the most the biggest factors and why they've been so successful is just their kind of range of opportunities and yeah. that they're willing to willing to give because they could realistically they could they have got I know like they've got the control of the one seat but realistically Ferrari told you they wanted both of their drivers in your car and they supply your engines yeah you're not going to so realistically they could have six drivers mm-hmm. because you're not going to say no when they supply everything for that like, has basically get everything from Ferrari yeah like they're not going to, what well, obviously they did with Mazepin, they basically said, no, we want him, but that was just so they had their own money. Mm-hmm. And I think if they really wanted to, Ferrari could fight and get who they want in the seats. Take, take a look at Alfa Romeo. They've got Kimi Raikkonen, legendary Ferrari driver, <laughs> who is coming to the end of his career and but still wanted to be in the sp- sport. Guess where Ferrari put him? Alfa just, Romeo. Antonio yeah. Giovinazzi was a Ferrari Driver Academy member. Look where they put him. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think Alfa Romeo are very good at taking on board Ferrari drivers and yeah. them reach all the way up to hopefully that Ferrari seat one day. Maris, I'm yeah. interested. Let me know who um, your favourite Ferrari <laughs> driver, Academy driver is. The thing is, I th- it's Callum Eilat and I think I it's such it. a testament. It's a testament to, um, oh, I was thinking like outside F1, obviously Mick Schumacher. Um, But like in terms of sort of, I don't know whether Mick's still in the junior programme, I guess. Um, Yes. But I think it's a testament to Ferrari and their whole family environment and things that even though Callum couldn't get a seat, they've gone, right, you can still be our test, like our test reserve driver. We're still going to give you the opportunity to, you know, grow and get the F1 experience whilst I think he's going off to do like um, endurance GT or something. Um, and it's so lovely that they've still kept him like in the family 
because I just get the feeling that teams like Red Bull, someone doesn't get a seat so that in F2 they can't move up and Red Bull will go mm, and that they won't support them anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think I just love Callum anyway, just him, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> The one controversial thing people have with the Ferrari Driver Academy is their choice in drivers and the surnames they carry with them. So obviously we've seen Alessi, Schumacher, Fittipaldi, one could argue Leclerc. Um, But I I I think the majority of the drivers they pick are talented enough despite their surname. Like, it isn't necessarily just their surname which is doing it for them because take Mick Schumacher yes he has one of the most well-known surnames in the motorsport world but he's so talented he's so talented and is a lovely human being as well yeah they could have sorry Lily go (laughs) I think it does help them having the name behind them like it carries clout in a way you know but I think like with the Leclerc name especially I think Ferrari want to have the brothers in F1 again because obviously mm-hmm. the Sh- I know the Schumacher brothers weren't racing in the same team but I think Ferrari wants to sort of like take it one step further and have Arthur and Charles racing yeah. together I as much as I don't know where Mick something. will fit in I don't know where Mick will fit into that maybe Arthur going to pass mm-hmm. Alfa Romeo but I think they want the brothers in F1 again like they want to recreate the Schumacher time with Leclerc definitely yeah. I think also if you if you pretend that 2014 doesn't didn't doesn't exist, that's pretend nothing happened in 2014. Who would be at Ferrari right now? Jules Bianchi, mm. Charles Leclerc. Yeah, I mean it'd be a dream team, wouldn't it? Dream that would be that would be amazing. The Godfather and the Godchild. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, I would that's do taking, anything like, to have mentor seen that. and mentee to a to a new level yeah. with that one. <laughs> that would have been so I think cool with um Mick Schumacher. The whole name thing, and people say, oh, they're all just here because of um, their names and things. Evidence of Mick Schumacher and the fact that he did, he probably could have got into F1 after the year in F2 because of his surname, but he he stayed in F2 second season for experience and proved to people when he won that championship that he deserves the seat regardless of his name. And I think that's really good that he said, right, I'm going to get that experience. Yeah, impression. I think <laughs> the name does help. You know, it, it, it's Especially like ninety like percent. Yeah, like ninety percent talent, and then ten percent his name mm-hmm. will get him in a hundred percent because it's like David Schumacher. He'll get up into F two no matter what. Yeah, just because he, I know he isn't the son of Michael. I'm like, you know, it's right. I'm still, saying it. It's I'm like, it's only right. Name. <laughs> I felt really. Like, it's only right. I don't mean it like that. I just mean like it's not Michael but he's still yeah. got the name so he'll still make it somewhere mm-hmm. even though David isn't hmm, isn't the best he hasn't done that much yeah yeah that's he's nice in a better I, I, team. he's in a better team this year so maybe who is he with this year I don't know let me check I've got a notebook with it all in I'm I feel so like sad. he's either I feel like he's either with Trident or ART and I'm leaning more towards Trident David Schumacher is with Trident, yes. Yeah, I was thinking it was Trident or ART, and I was like, I feel like I've seen the picture of him in the blue. Mm-hmm. I think also Ferrari or the Driver Academy is, they're never going to pick someone solely because of their name. Like if they, say in an alternate universe where Mick Schumacher came up and just was binning it every race, they're obviously not going to pick him to be part of a driver academy if there's no potential there and no like any real talent or consistency because that would completely defeat the point of having a driver academy and it would 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 lose the money yeah it would lose the money it would defeat it'd make them look it would make them look really stupid and I think anybody that tries to argue that you know people like Mick or even Leclerc only got their seats because of who they are you can't deny that it doesn't have something to do with it but at the end of the day they're racing teams looking to win races and championships so picking someone with no talent would be stupid so yeah yeah, no point. A, yeah exactly so I think Ferrari are looking very strong for the future and I have all my fingers crossed that we're going to see a lot of these guys in Formula One, particularly a certain Marcus Armstrong. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I agree there. I second that. I cannot lie, and I know this is going to get me hate for being a girl that likes most, but I have the biggest crush on Marcus Armstrong. <laughs> I'm just going to... I mean, who there. doesn't? Who doesn't? Yeah, who doesn't? I feel yeah. like, yeah, everyone has to. It, it's his accent as well. The accent just yes. boosts him up, you know, makes him a better driver. Yes. Shall Ooh. I read this thing out from our driver stats guy now? So basically, yeah. to come to a conclusion in today's episode, we want to discuss whether drivers need to move on do the older drivers need to move on and so our driver stats guy Ian, has sent me this word document that i'm going to read out because it's very very good formula one often gets criticized for not giving young talent the opportunities we think they deserve and often it's the oldest drivers who get the blame for the lack of youth presence in the sport these older drivers aren't pushovers though seven times world champion lewis hamilton two-time world champion Fernando Alonso and one-time champion Kimi Raikkonen are the resident pensioners of the grid. We all know Sir Lewis Hamilton. Since his F1 debut in 2007, he's won seven world championships and still dominates the grid to this day. He's the co-record holder for the most championships, tied with Michael Schumacher, of course, and has won the most races in F1 history with 95 wins and had the most poles in F1 history with 98 to his name. He started his career with Manor Motorsport and Formula Renault UK and stayed with them until he reached the F3 Euro Series and switched to ASM for his second season in the series. After winning the championship that year, he moved to GP2 with ART and won in his debut season, which he almost replicated a year later in his F1 debut with McLaren in 2007. He only needed to wait another year to claim his first F1 championship in that Interlagos race. Since then, he moved to Mercedes in 2013 and won six championships with the Silver Arrows, cementing himself as one of the best drivers in F1 history at 36 years old. 39-year-old Fernando Alonso is a new driver to the grid this year after returning to Renault, or should I say Alpine, to drive alongside Esteban Ocon and replacing McLaren signing Daniel Ricciardo. Alonso is often regarded as one of the greatest F1 drivers in the history of, of the sport. Journalists and fellow drivers regarded Alonso as a fast and consistent driver who can extract additional pace from a car in all weathers and all tracks. Fernando made his F1 debut 20 years ago with Minardi, finishing 23rd. A year later, he moved to Renault and after a year as a test driver and two years on the grid, he claimed his first championship and won the year after making him only the ninth driver at the time to win back-to-back championships. He stayed in F1, bouncing around teams such as McLaren, Renault and Ferrari until 2018, where he left the sport to pursue endurance racing and IndyCar, where he was successful winning the 2018 World Endurance Championship and winning the 24 Hour of Le Mans twice. In 2020, he decided it was time to return for the 2021 season with Alpine and stir quite the controversy as he was allowed to participate in the Young Drivers Test. His return also was unlucky to Renault Academy drivers and F2 drivers Guan Yu Zhou and Christian Lingard, who were tipped to replace Ricardo before Alonso was announced. Did Alpine make the right choice in choosing Alonso over the young guns, or will Alonso drown in the harsh circumstances of the 2021 season? We'll have to wait and see. Finally, Kimi Raikkonen, the Iceman, the Flying Finn, the guy that sees F1 more like a hobby. The 41-year-old is the oldest driver on the grid and is F1's resident dinosaur. The Alfa Romeo driver started his career in 1999 in Formula Renault UK for Hayward Racing before moving to Manor Motorsport for another year in the series, which he ended up winning that year. He made his F1 debut in 2001 with Sauber before moving to McLaren for five years, where he finished second twice for the British outfit. He then moved to Ferrari, where he won the World Drivers' Championship and then spent another two years with the team, before subsequently taking a hiatus from F1 to pursue rally and stock racing, before returning to the grid with Lotus for the 2012 season, where he finished third in that entertaining season. From 2014 to 18, he drove for Ferrari once again, where he picked up a third-place championship finish before moving to the renamed Alfa Romeo team, where he still drives to this day. So as we can tell from that lovely driver stats brief, We have three very, very talented drivers who are ageing. And do they need to give up their seats for the young guns? That is the question I'm putting to you to sum this podcast up. I will literally back Hamilton all the way and say no. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, I think even even though I'm like a massive Hamilton fan, I think people who like aren't his biggest fan would still say he doesn't need to go. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as he stays there and I think it all depends on whether 
they're still competitive and are determined to push their team forward and really work hard, which I think is the difference between experienced drivers and rookies. Yeah. Depending on like the rookies are there to get experience, so they'll do everything in their power to get as much experience and help push the team forward and do everything. Whereas the older experienced drivers will sort of be giving their knowledge, like it's a whole different dynamic. And I think Hamilton in that Mercedes, they they like help each other out and it's like constantly moving forward. And it, I don't know, it's just, I don't think he needs to leave. It's all, basically it's all up to him. As soon as he yeah. goes, the whole world of F1's gonna change. So. Yeah. I think um, the most significant one for me is Kimi Raikkonen. I think his contract really prevents Alfa Romeo from being used, especially this year, to bring up rookie talent. Um, but I think it it all comes down to where the team is as well in terms of their experience and whether they, you know, we spoke about it earlier about with Alpine bringing in Alonso, are they going to value the experience of an older driver more than, I don't know, the fresh eyes of a rookie? Um, but I think for me, Kimi is not going to be around for, for much longer. And I, I was quite surprised that he stayed for this year um but yeah that's it's all down to the condition of the team and what they would value and where they would get the most performance out of I think yeah I think like Lewis Hamilton he's bringing something to the sport still he's bringing I don't mean he's not bringing exciting races obviously we know he's going to win the races usually but he's still winning he's still doing something whereas Alonso has left and come back like you retired Mm-hmm. you know once you retire I feel like you should retire stay. <laughs> like, you, you know you should stay especially from a sport like Formula One Kimi Raikkonen yeah he's passed it you know he's been in it since before I was born same mm-hmm. as Alonso I just yeah. think you know give a chance just give a chance to someone else maybe yeah yeah so to conclude I do think we we need to give the young guys uh opportunity and whether driver academies will do that, who knows? It's all down to our opinions. But my personal opinion is that Ferrari Driver Academy is the best. And Alpine Academy is one of the worst, okay, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> definitely. Anyone have anything else to add before we finish this off? I think we've covered everything. No, I think no, we've covered everything. Yeah. Conversation. Yeah. yeah. So... Thank you for listening or watching this podcast. Make sure you subscribe or follow us and follow our social media at Sector One Podcast. And we will be back with another very entertaining episode very, very soon.